Well, I started uh, professional life off as, as on the academic route. So I started at the University of Chicago, and sometime in grad school, when I was a computer science major, uh, I took a class in artificial intelligence and uh, from Devika Subramanian, who is uh, now, I think, at Rice University. And that lit up an excitement about what would end up becoming my future uh, in a way that I'd never had before. It was like a, a light switched on. And so from there, I, uh, I worked in the city for a year, and then I followed one of my pals from Cornell to University of Chicago, and I just got uh, a PhD in over five years there at, uh, at the U of C in AI. And, uh, and my work there was in planning. So it was in making computers work in an environment that was shared a lot of the same characteristics as everyday environments that we're in so that it could learn how to make trade-offs like people do and learn to do short-term tasks and long-term tasks. And then from that, it was such a fertile time that gave me the confidence to go out and make stuff up, basically. B build, build new product. Uh, you know, in, in any different dom domain in, within a IT. So that was my launching point, you know, was, uh, I would say my, that academic, you know, background. So the start of the company was I was consulting for Motorola while I was still in Chicago, and I had a really long commute back and forth from Hyde Park to Schaumburg, uh, where, where the office I, had, I was working in. On my way back, and I would listen to NPR, and I would be stuck in traffic, and it was terrible. And on NPR, I was hearing an interview with a filmmaker um, who had just won Sundance. And, and I didn't pay that close attention to the film industry or Hollywood, so anyway, I'm just passing the time driving. And it turns out that the winner that year was a guy named Ed Burns, who did a movie called The Brothers McMullen. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Ed Burns, that's a pretty common name. But then I heard the voice, I'm like, that's Ed Burns that I went to high school with. And uh, and like. There we go. Ed Burns, you know, who I went to high school with, just won Sundance, and now he's like some big famous filmmaker. If Ed can make a movie, I can start a company. So it was really <laughs> the, the genesis of this wasn't really a any particular product insight at the time, but really just this entrepreneurial drive to, to actually create something. And I've told Ed this since then, and he th thinks that's a good funny story. Um, but the uh, idea for Fatwire started off actually in that consulting project where we saw that there was so much information f being published to internal and external sites and that uh, there were so many people creating the content that we needed a mechanism, this companies needed a mechanism to be able to allow non-technical peoples to manage that content more effectively. That's what Fatwire was, was founded on. Did you begin with end in mind? Did you realize that you want to sell that company or is this something happened during the process? Beginning with the end in mind, it's a good question because the, uh, any, any entrepreneurial project that I've done has pivoted a number of times. And in the very beginning days of Fatwire, we actually had a couple product ideas. And we realized at that time we could only do one of them. So we, we basically made a, almost a leap of faith that content management was going to be a really big market. And that was the right bet. And I can't say that we knew who we were going to sell to, when it was going to be, um, and there was a lot of adjustments along the way. But, but we did have a sense that this was a really, really big market opportunity. And there was a lot of twists and turns along the way because this was in the 90s as the, as the bubble was, was frothing and then ultimately popped, and then you had a recession, and then you had a second recession. So there was, um, you know, there was a lot of improvising, a lot of building, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. But we had this, definitely had this, we were convinced that this was going to be a very big market. Why do you think your company, uh, Fatware, became successful? I, I would say there's different things at different stages of the company. So in the very early stages, we took no money into the business. We got it to about three or four million in sales with no venture capital, just credit cards, not unlike your story. And this attitude that my partners and I at the time, the other, my other co-founders, was that we would just, we would sell the chairs we sat on. If, if we had to, uh, to, to make, you know, generate revenue to support the business. And what that meant is, <clears throat> in the early days, doing a fair amount of professional services that was related to the product that we were dreaming of. So 80% uh, of our revenue in the early days was probably professional services, consulting fees for building bespoke systems for customers. Um, and 
we knew that the company we wanted to build was not a pure services company, but we really had that faith that from this it was going to fund the R&D and ultimately from this cloud of chaotic features, a, a coherent product was going to come out of it. So in the early days, what it took was uh, you know, going out and seeing what the customer wanted. Um, and then I would say, in, after we got to some sales, then what I think made the company successful was uh, it was very driven by culture, um, which I think uh, the culture of persistence and, and, and innovation were, were two probably of the most important characteristics that the team had. And uh, persistence probably being the most important one. Um, because, uh, you know, there are some companies that have a trajectory where they start and they get really lucky and it's the right timing. And it, but this, this took a dozen years plus, uh, you know, to get to its exit. Um, and, you know, there was, there was a lot of times, let's say after 9-11, when no one was buying technology. For sure no one was buying technology from, you know, startup or smaller companies. And uh, you really just had to <laughs> cut, cut it out. Can you share some of your uh, failure stories with us and how you applied uh, the lessons you have learned from those uh, failures within your personal and business life? Sure. Uh, for me, learning from failure is like practically a religion because in my, back from my, my grad school days and my academic years, that was the type of machine learning we did, it was learning from failure. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's a big tradition within AI. And um, so academically, I was already predisposed to that. I'd already been thinking for years about uh, setting expectations, running a plan, seeing how your plan met or didn't meet expectations. And when it didn't, then you, you go back and repair your plan. So I'd already done five years of you know, PhD research on this and, and been thinking a lot about this. But of course, it's, it's nothing in comparison to the actual real world. So one of the things that comes to mind in this was where I felt like I was in the middle of a massive failure and how sometimes failures can be stepping stones to what ultimately becomes something of a much bigger success. And, and here's a quick story on that. Um, in 2003, we had gone through a flat revenue period after 9-11. It was a very tough time for technology companies. And uh, we were flat, we were losing money, we had some money in the bank, not a ton. And, uh, and I felt like we just weren't going to organically grow and innovate our way out of this. So, uh, so I brought my partners in. As I remember, it was a super dark, you know, it was December 2012. Was, days were super short, and it was a very grim time. And I said, you know, I don't think we're going to, you know, I don't think we're going to grow our way out of this. I think we've got to think of something different. Uh, and so I know this sounds crazy, but I think we might want to do an acquisition or a merger um, to get some more scale. Um, because even though we're hurting as a company, uh, I bet there's other people out there that are hurting worse. So I went out there and I looked for six months and I found one and it was a company called Open Market that was one of our competitors for years. When I say competitor, we were the ankle biter. They were the giant. They went public. They had a market cap of billion dollars plus. They would raised uh, three, over $300 million and, uh, and they had gone bankrupt uh, in, the, in the context of, a, of acquiring a company called Divine. So I was going up to Boston where the, where the bankruptcy proceedings was, ha was happening. There was a big complicated bid, 48 hours, no, no sleep, straight through the night where component bidders were trying to carve up this company into bankruptcy. And I had my, this competitor that I could buy um, in this bankruptcy for a you know, reasonable, ultimately we bought it for six and a half million dollars, but for a reasonable amount of money given how much money went into it, how many customers they had. And so it was so close. But of course, not only had I, I'd never done, I'd never been involved in any type of bankruptcy on either side. Uh, I've never done an acquisition. I was completely <laughs> unqualified to, to come out there with, with a winning bid. Uh, but, you know, I had the, whatever, the gumption to go and do it. Uh, there was a point at which I felt I had completely blew it. I had a, uh, a lawyer. Uh, who was part of the bankruptcy proceedings working for us that I felt uh, had embarrassed me, feuding with one of my uh, other component bidders and was, and was threatening to actually blow up the entire bankruptcy proceeding. It was, it was dramatic. I mean, it was in the bankruptcy court. You had the bankruptcy judge there, and my guy is feuding without my authorization or knowledge with 
uh, the component bidder, and the, and the judge is, is saying, you know what, if you guys don't get your act together, uh, we're going to we're gonna start this from completely from scratch. And, and the, <laughs> the entire courtroom of like, you know, all these high played you know, deal guys and lawyers looks at me and I'm like, you know, <laughs> just trying to be, become invisible. So the next day, we had, you know, we had the, the bankruptcy proceeding, uh, you know, continue to the next day. So, uh, so I'm taking my, taking the cab, cab to the shuttle, and I was feeling terrible, absolutely terrible. And so the cab driver I had, you, this is a remarkable story, his name was Moses, of all things. And, uh, you know, he was an immigrant, from, I don't know where from, I spoke with a heavy accent, and so he starts talking to me. So here I am, I'm on the verge of tears, you know, blowing this whole thing. And then he gives me a pep talk on the way from the Tip O'Neill building to get the shuttle. And, and I went from completely failed to I was going to make this thing work, partially because I had this moment of grace with this uh, wonderful cab driver named Moses, who I never, of course, would run into again in my life. So in that case, you had an example where you know, failure a lot of times is a feeling. It's like you feel terrible, you feel like you're blowing it. You know, ultimately, I didn't blow it. We did come out with the deal at the end of the day by being persistent. And um, sometimes, you know, you just have to be able to gut through that initial failure. By looking at your academic background, you have a strong understanding about computer science, you have engineering mind. How did you learn about leadership and management? I think along the way, there were uh, people who I looked up to, and I, uh, starting at the very start with my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law uh, runs a uh, help desk services company in Chicago. Uh, it's very successful, and she was my initial coach. And uh, so she, uh, I took a bunch of classes at the uh, Graduate School of Business, now the Booth School at Chicago. Uh, she gave me pointers along the way, spent a lot of time with me. I read as m everything that I could. I joined YPO, you know, President's Organization, so I could learn a lot from my peers. And so along the way, you know, I was able, you know, when the teacher's ready, or when the student is ready, the teacher appears. That, that was definitely true throughout my, uh, throughout my career. Do you think that a leader needs to develop a different types of qualities in order to start a business versus running a successful organization that already have profitable revenue? I do think so. I think that the, what it takes to be the a sort of startup CEO or startup leader is almost the believer in chief. You have to be able to see the, you know, see the future, listen to customers, synthesize, you know, a lot of different inputs and motivate a team. Whereas for a mature company, that, that actually could be dangerous, uh, you know, the believer in chief, where you could be careening off to, you know, a certain direction, you know, all of your value and your entire customer's processes and company are geared to something different. So. Absolutely, and I think that the, the larger company CEOs that I've met uh, that are able to contain both are, are very rare, but the, what I think it takes to, re, to run a big company is a ability to delegate in a way that startup CEOs can't. Um, ability to arbitrate and manage a team of, of executives in a way that you never get that those level executives in, in a startup, usually working with much younger people. So uh, there, it's pretty rare to have someone who is a, a, an effective startup CEO run a Fortune 500 company. Uh, but if you surround you know, yourself with people that can complement and create those systems and the processes, uh, you know, it obviously does happen sometimes. What are the challenges you're facing with your portfolio companies? Sure. Well, one of the things that we look to do at Canrock as a fund is, is take the entrepreneur's point of view because we are entrepreneurs uh, in a way that it's pretty rare to find in the VC community. We will start some of the businesses and there's some of them, some of the VCs out there are doing like we are in the seed stage, but we get very, very, very involved. So one of the things that between me and my partners, we have the experience of being startup CEOs. So what we'll do at the start of a relationship with a new team leader for a startup is have a talk about our experience in building and running companies uh, and be very straight to say the skill set you need for the first 18 to 24 months uh, 
may not be the skill set that's needed for 24 months to 5 million in sales and then 5 million in sales and beyond. And what that does is it level sets to the startup leader and says, there's no guarantee, or don't think of this as you're the CEO forever and to be attached to that role or that title, but be attached to the mission of the company and a drive to make it as big as possible. And they have to make sure that they're, in, they're incented with enough equity in the business that they really want to see it succeed. But I think what ends up happening, and I think historically has happened with a lot of VCs, is that when they put money into a business, uh, you know, a lot of VCs will say the same thing, that they're pro-entrepreneur and they want to be supportive. But the fact is that there are these transition points where you may need to bring other, other leaders in, either to complement or to put on, on top in some cases. But what ends up happening, since that's a difficult conversation, it gets put off. And the longer that you put that off, um, then the CEO knows it, you know, the, the VC knows it, they're sort of avoiding this. And, uh, and it just it creates a, what I think, a, an avoidable dynamic, whereas that's something that we, we do straight at the start, start. So if, let's say, that startup CEO is able to mature and become, you know, run the company from a million to five million sales and beyond, they have a sense of an accomplishment beyond what they would have if they thought they were entitled to that, that spot you know, forever. And um, on the flip side, if someone else is brought in, they don't have a, as crushing a sense of defeat because what's end up happening is the company is succeeding and they should feel terrific about that. So I think that that's one of the things that we do a little bit differently because we've, we've been in those shoes before. The company has three partners and, and we've all known each other for years. In fact, we all met through YPO. And Jim Estel and I are the two full-time partners at Canrock. And we both have had uh, success in building companies up. Uh, Jim, who's got a more, you know, he's got about 10, 10 years on me, has had a terrific run of angel investing, prolific, over 100 deals. And uh, his biggest deal was BlackBerry, which he was on the board of for 13 years. And one of the things that we saw that VCs did is that they would basically hand the money over and participate on the board and do the best that they can uh, to stay involved. But there's only so much time that you can devote to each company. So we tried to f mess with the standard VC model. And we said, look, we're going to invest in seed stage. But if we're doing our job as, as an investment management team, we're taking risk out. How do you take risk out? You can't take risk out by visiting once a quarter or once a month or having a phone call once in a while. We felt you could take risk out by having the CEO's desk 20 yards away and, you can, and you're talking to them every day and as well as the rest of the team. So we had this idea of being able to create a cluster of companies that we would incubate and, um, and that for us has been extremely rewarding. I, I believe that the companies that we're growing are doing so with less capital uh, and are doing and are getting results faster than if we had done it the standard way. And frankly, they were doing it faster than I had done it even with Fatwire because we were fairly isolated. Of the 20 companies that we have in the last almost three years, we've written down two of them. And Jim, my partner, has a has a good slogan: is you know, fail, fail often, fail fast, fail cheap. Um, and so what we look to do is we'll look at putting about a quarter million dollars into a company in order to get it from squiggles on a napkin to product um, or business plan to product to go out there and see. It's, right, it's like running an experiment to see how does the market accept this product. Because at a certain point you can focus group and you can survey people but at the end of the day if you're building something in a new category you, you really can't get that market feedback until you show them this is what it is. And so basically what we'll do is we'll work on, you know, we'll, we'll allocate a certain amount of capital to build that product, see what the market uh, adoption is, make sure we have the right team for it, and if we don't have the right team or if the market's not adopting, then we'll pull the plug. And how we're confident about that is that, you know, as fund managers, we'll actually go on sales calls. We'll, we'll see how the market is reacting to this. We'll, you know, we're working with the CEOs, uh, you know, every day. So we developed, uh, you know, a pretty confident uh, sense of whether we've got the right team or the product is, is at the right time. I, I love this question because it's endless debate. It's almost like a philosophical debate where on any given day, you know, people will feel strongly 
about one way and then next week the other way. There are some VCs that are strictly, we bet on teams, um, but on the same side, the teams are always incomplete and you always have to fill them in and the teams always look very different you know, down the road. And on the other side, uh, you know, ideas are what kicks off excitement and the startup and investment in a company, but almost all the time the idea ends up morphing into something sometimes completely different. So the way I would say we take a very practical approach and almost we don't, we're not religious about whether it's the team or the idea because we know that those things are going to change over time. But what we try to do in those fragile or early years is try to create a system and a culture among the people, the best people that we can find and you can afford and can attract into a business in order to make that successful. But um, sometimes it's heavier on the idea and you're basically building it with the hopes that you'll be able to attract you know, a strong team down the road. And other times you've got a really strong you know, CEO and you've, you know that they'll figure it out over time. So I would say that we're, we're agnostic on that decision. But we are, if there was religion that we have, we, we really are very religious about having a collaborative, open, transparent environment where there's really a, a, a big blending between the investor's perspective and the entrepreneur's perspective, that there really is no difference between the two. Those differences happen later when you get to Series A and Series B, but we're all sort of in it together, I would say, in the start. We classify our portfolio into, into two categories, essentially. One are the incubated companies, which are co-located with us, um, that we have a lot more involvement with. And then there are the more passive you know, growth or feeder companies. These would be startups that we put a little bit of money in to see, essentially reserve a spot for investing in the future. Um, so I would say in terms of how much heart do we put into these things, it, it, it clearly goes into the incubated companies. We want success for all of our investments, but in terms of where we put the most dollars, the most time, it's by definition the ones that, are, that we're incubating. Um, so passing the bar to be, be an incubated company means you go past a lot of hurdles. But if it makes past that hurdle, then obviously that means we're going to continue to invest in it. Um, and we'll put more and more time into it. So what it boils down to Jim and I and, and the rest of the Canrock team is figuring out and making sure that we are allocating our time effectively across these portfolio companies and that the ones that we're making sure we're putting enough time and the ones that we're putting a lot of dollars in and the ones that are the neediest. Um, there's a life cycle that each one of these companies goes through in terms of how needy they are. So Karma 411 is a great example. So Karma, I, I love that company and, and John Merck is doing a terrific job of growing it. Um, but that would be a good example of a company that in the first couple years it took a lot of my time. You know, even to the point of actually programming in the early days. But now it's at the point where John has got that thing running, he's in growth mode, you know, hiring salespeople, you know, expanding the existing teams. And we interact really as chairman to CEO level, where we prep for board meetings, we, you know, I talk to him every day, but the amount of involvement he needs is much less than when it was in the early stages. So there's a curve, there's a maturity curve, so the time demands, you know, if this is over time, you know, in the early days it needs a lot, then it tapers off if it's successful. And if it's not, then it's pretty much a candidate for this might not have been a very good idea. So there's a, a, over the course of a year, two, three, four years, you know, we're looking for the point where it, the, the time demands are, are smaller, so we can plow into the, to the other companies that are needier, the little babies. We look at these things as each, each company as uh, like a baby. Right? So you got to nurture the baby, you got to feed it, you know, they can't do much for itself in the very early days, but then after a point it's a toddler, it's a teenager, and, and ultimately they either kick them out of the house or they, or they graduate on to, to college. So, um, you know, we have that same sense of what that's our purpose as a fund. Our vision for the future of Kenrock is to establish Kenrock itself as a business. We're investing in business, but of course, like every fund, it is a business itself. So I would say the first couple years were spent in developing the expertise and the processes and the team to run a seed fund, an incubating seed fund, uh, which means you have to invent a lot of stuff, a couple people to learn from out there, but you have to invent a lot. Um, and I would say that that's established. We run that for another two or three years, 
uh, and we'll have enough up rounds and exits to show that the model is working, we're good at picking ideas and people and companies and uh, be able to attract other investors over time, that ultimately our vision is to take this seed fund capability and pair it with later stage capital so that uh, you never, you're always generating your own pipeline uh, as well as looking out for larger, you know, later stage deals. Uh, and in this way, you're, it's a hedge against the market ever getting too expensive. Professional investors, everybody knows that if you pay too much for an investment, uh, you know, even if it's a great company, you're going to blow your returns. And that can happen, uh, you know, as hot ideas come up and, and uh, VCs and investors will bid up and pay too much for a company and, and they won't uh, get the return for the risk. The way we look at it is that we want to be able to guarantee that we're not going to be in that position uh, across the board because we'll always have our stable of companies that we've got a very low, low cost basis in because we started them. Uh, all these companies that you invested, how did you locate those founders? How yep. did you locate those ideas? Yep. Where do you find them? Do they come to you or you have a marketing or sales process to recruit those sure. potential companies? The way that we look to recruit the entrepreneurial teams is mostly network-based. So as professionals at CamRock, we have pretty big networks. So I'll give you two examples. Um, with Thrive Metrics, which is a company that uses social and media analytics to measure the internal corporate communication, to measure the health of a company and its customers. Um, that, we had this idea that had come from another company that we're currently in called General Sentiment that does the same type of social media analytics on the public internet. So one idea begats another. That company, we, we want to start this, but we didn't have a startup CEO for it. Uh, and so I was introduced to a very smart strategist uh, from an angel investor um, named Natasha Schrowitz, uh, who helped us write that business plan. And uh, very bright, Columbia MBA. And so she wrote the business plan together. We spent a lot of time together on this. And we put it in front of the investment committee. Investment committee, after some uh, you know, feedback, says, let's go for it. Um, at that point, and uh, we were always you know, had in mind that Natasha would actually be the team lead for that thing to get that product you know, out to market, which is what she's doing today. So in that case, it came from a connection from a friend, an angel investor. And, um, and that, was, that was terrific. And that, that happens all the time. Another company uh, that we have called Proceeder in our portfolio, our newest mm -hmm. company, newest incubated company, that was started by Ken Gatz, who was, uh, like John Murcott, a already an experienced CEO. He already built a company to over 20 million in sales. Already, you know, it's had the experience of selling a company. And he came to us saying, I hear you guys are expert in crowdfunding and you've got this, uh, you know, expertise in building companies. Um, he wasn't particularly technical, but he had a huge business background, a legal background, and perfect for what Proceeder does. And, uh, and that was a, a perfect joint venture. So we supplied some of the capital. He became the CEO, very bankable guy. And Karma 411, which had a lot of core technology, essentially licensed and handed over the technology to this company so that, and this has never happened to me before, that company went from startup to its first demo in 45 days. What advice do you have for young people who want to rise to the top? What I would say for young entrepreneurs, one of the most common paths that you take is that you build a product. So you get a, uh, you, you develop a passion for what you may see as a need in the marketplace, but more, more often you, you're inspired by a need and you fall in love with the product. And part of my experience was developing the confidence that I didn't need to know everything. I didn't have to have all the answers as the startup CEO or as a team member. And that you just have to get it 80%. And you have to get it in the ballpark. And then you let the market tell you, let the world tell you what's important. And what I would say for myself and what I see for other budding startup entrepreneurs is that they wait too long to take it to the marketplace. They, they want to prove themselves because they have never done anything in their career. So they're very eager to impress you and get you won over with their knowledge about the product and their vision and passion about the product. So that's great. But 
it often comes to the point where they should have shut up an hour ago and just listened to what the customer had to say. And if I had to say that's one thing that if I look back on my own career as a start, an entrepreneur, I would have stopped talking sooner and listened to what the customer said. And, it, and that's kind of one of the pieces of advice I give to almost every startup, product-oriented startup uh, entrepreneur that, that comes to, you know, into our offices. How do you define right people? Uh, what are the characteristics do you look for when you are hiring a key person for one of your portfolio companies? There's a, there's a great book uh, by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. And in this, he talks about interviewing people and how in the early part of his career he had this experience in the uh, Israeli military where they would uh, interview officer candidates and judge them by their future potential as leaders. And he talks about the experience of being very confident about uh, their prognosis for each and every person that they were evaluating and goes on to say that this data was tested you know, because as the years passed they saw what those people actually did. And he found that they were spectacularly wrong in, in their, uh, their, their predictions about who was going to be successful. And so on the one hand you could say, gee, maybe interviewing is a worthless enterprise and you can you know, just flip a coin anyway. But that's not actually what Kahneman ends up saying in the book and he says that rather than getting caught up in the feeling and the emotion and the, the, the personal chemistry connection that you have with a person, uh, that you have more of a structured process of questions that you ask each and every one of them and you try to find some kind of objective measure. And no objective measure is going to be complete but his, I think the point of the book is that having that as your basis is going to give you better, more sound judgments. So for example, in hiring salespeople, uh, that, which is a notoriously difficult thing, there's always turnover and it's, look, sales is, is, a, is an art and it's hard to, you know, to sell a new product in a new category when, when the thing is half-baked to begin with. So, you know, one of the things that we look for is, is past success. So it, it will be very common for us to say we'd like to see the last two or three years of your W-2s and we want you to pitch us in a sort of role play scenario uh, so you can actually see how they're selling. Not past stories, not you know, philosophies of selling, but just the experience of how they're selling. So that would be you know, looking for evidence uh, and, and being able to do things in more structured interviews is the ideal. Um, that said, <clears throat> when I was younger, I would say that my ability, because I didn't have that much experience, my ability to judge a superior candidate from a you know middle candidate was let's say whether it's engineering management sales marketing what have you was um, I had less experience I had less ability to do it I, I knew so many fewer people so I didn't I, references were were often cold and you know meaning I had no other connection with them so they they weren't necessarily always uh, you know the the most transparent that you could get um, and at that point the advice I have for people who don't, you know, who are early in their careers is have lots of people interview, people that you trust interviewing that person and then synthesize and find, you know, what these common, common um, experiences were. Uh, now, however, the, with the benefit of having a really big network um, and a lot of people you trust looking out for you and, and vice versa, um, you're able to you know, find people who are already have already passed through so many different hurdles, whether they've worked for someone, you know, a friend's other company, and said that guy was terrific, or this woman coming in that had, uh, uh, you know, that knows two or three of your board members already. Th that definitely gives you such a huge advantage versus you know starting off cold with no network. And um, so I would say references um, and uh, and having more structured interviews are, are are the key for us.